Yes, so welcome back. I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Andrew J. Scott, who is the co-founder of the Longevity Forum, um, co-author of a number of books, uh, but 100 Year Life and The New Long Life. So say, Andrew, thanks very much for your time. I'm very grateful. I mean, to start, it's a very, very simple point. How, how did you first get interested in longevity? Yeah, so I mean, it was always sort of personal and professional. And personal one was just sort of getting older and just thinking <laughs> actually about my kids doing things differently from me and then recognising I did things differently from my parents and thinking why. And, and that actually got me into longevity and perhaps we can talk about that. But I'm an economics professor and I used to give a lecture on an ageing society and it's a really miserable story. And you're probably aware of the story, which is that there's fewer people being born, more people living for longer, and so they're just more old people. The average Brit has never been so old. And that's always been seen as a problem because we worry about old age. Uh, you know, people get ill, they need healthcare, they don't work, they need a pension. But if you look at the key statistic, the key statistic is on average, we're living longer and we're healthier for longer, which sounds like really good news to me. So I sort of flipped it around from an aging society, which is what we do in the semi old people to saying, well, actually, what does it mean for us as a person if we're living these longer lives, what do we do differently? And, you know, I said the average British has never been so old. They've also never had so long left to live. So I think, you know, that's kind of the really big changes happening in society. It's not just we're older, but everyone, whatever their age, has more time ahead of them than past generations. So you need to behave differently. Yeah. So that's how I got into it. And of course, once you start thinking of the topic like longevity, you see it everywhere. You see it in the economy, you see it in healthcare, you see it in science and medicine, but also in, as I say, the way my kids behave. I mean, it, it seems to be a really interesting time for longevity and anti-aging. I mean, certainly in the scientific community, there's enormous advances being made, both in terms of scientific advance and in terms of profile. It sometimes feels, I mean, this may be just in my view as an outsider, but it sometimes feels that... Um, I suppose the sort of political societal interests are lagging behind a bit because obviously the, the, the changes that are potentially being talked about are, are very dramatic. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, do you think that's the case? Do you think we are still, as a society, or, or certainly our, our political leadership, are failing to seriously address longevity and the anti aging movement? No, no doubt for sure. I mean, I think you know, it's interesting because. Um, you know, I'm beginning to see like in reaction to the book, The 100 Year Life, which wasn't about the science. It was just saying, actually, a child born today has a very good chance of living to 100, irrespective of scientific progress, according to the UK government. Yeah. Uh, you know, about one in five kids born, uh, women, girls born uh, now will live to be 100. So how do you plan for that 100 year life? That's a, a new imperative. And certainly that got a great reaction, that book, globally. And a lot of people are saying, yeah, I, I'm behaving differently. I need to behave differently. The governments, I think, are beginning to wake up to, but in general, they're behind. And I think, you know, this is, it's such a fundamental change. I can't begin to describe it. You know, when, for the first time ever in human history, young children today can expect to live into their 90s, according to UK government numbers. And we've had people living to 80s and 90s before, but not the majority. So we need to reconfigure life differently because we've now got to prepare not for the off chance you'll get 80 or 90, but actually it's more than 50%. So that requires some pretty fundamental thinking that conflicts with how we've always lived our life in the past. It conflicts with what we think about as being old. And the other really big change that's happened is that really, and this is where the scientists are getting very interesting in terms of their discoveries, but we know that how we age is malleable. You know, we know that our environment influences it. We know what we eat and drink and how we exercise and what we do. We can influence how we age. And I think that's the hard thing because we still think of aging as something as fixed. And we think back historically. And so I think governments aren't alone. It's a pretty fundamental change in how we think about living our life. You know, I said earlier that the average Brit has never been so old, but never had so long left to live because we measure age chronologically. We measure age, how many candles on your birthday cake. Yeah. But a really important part of your age is how many more birthday cakes can you expect? But we don't think about that. We always think just about what's happened. And I say it's a really profound change. So governments are certainly behind. Um, and I think the other challenge we've got is that governments think about this as about lots of old people. So then we have a health system that supports old people. But of course, what's really important is that we age well, and that's better done when people are younger rather than intervening when people are old. So I think that's the other way in which we sort of just think 
you know, old people just emerge from somewhere. They're not, they, we never <laughs> draw the connection between them being young and how that connects through. And that's the really big change I think we have uh, to, to, get, to get across. I mean, my understanding is that it's not just an increase in lifespan, it's an increase in health span as well, which obviously two very different and, and, and disparate things. Uh, I mean, it, it, is that correct? It is. Um, and, you know, it's not quite glass half full, half empty, but 100%. If you look at the data, um, on average, we're living longer and we're healthier for longer. And broadly speaking, the proportion of life we spend in good health is remaining the same. So that's great. In other words, most of the years of good health have been good. The only trouble is not all of them have. So the end of life, uh, one is frail, has got longer, as well as the number of years in good health that's got longer has increased. So there's a lot of good news, but that widening period at the end of life where frailty hits is getting longer, and that's a challenge. And of course, the other problem you've got is these are all averages. Uh, and you know, people age really differently. You can be uh, in your 50s or you can be literally running 100 meters aged 100. So I think the other thing is these averages are, uh, are a challenge. So of course, the really important thing is not just to live for longer, but to make sure that we're healthier for longer. And the other changes occurring right now, and it is a striking one, is that most of the gains in life expectancy that are happening, and perhaps we can talk about COVID later, which of course complicates things, but perhaps not as much as people might think. Um, most of the gains of life expectancy are happening now are coming after the age of 70. So more of the life expectancy gains now are coming in years that are in less good health. But the really big thing that's happened is kind of like middle age has got longer. That sort of period 50 to 70 has become uh, one that people are more likely to experience and more likely to experience in good health. And so seizing those opportunities is really important. I mean, I, I noticed I was looking for some statistic, um, statistics before the interview. Uh, there are obviously a couple of anom anomalies um, of which the United States is a very prominent one. In over the past few years, its life expectancy has been staying, well, at best staying level and, and generally yeah. actually falling slightly. Um, I mean, I, I don't get, I know this is an individual case, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but um, I've, I've heard various explanations for that associated with um, dr drugs comes up quite a lot, as, as in obviously illegal drugs. I mean, is, is there something particular about the United States that means it's, it's no longer following this general rule of, of adding you know, two, two years every 10 decades? Well, it's not just the US. I mean, the UK doesn't do brilliantly on this. So there's a thing called best practice life expectancy, which is an extraordinary chart. And it shows the country at any point in time that has the highest life expectancy at birth. So it shows you just kind of what's possible. And that famously uh, has increased by about two or three years every decade over the last 200 years. Uh, it's probably slowing down a little bit at the moment. There's some debate about that, but it's probably still one and a half. As, as we find more of the life facility gains coming later in life, it's harder to keep increasing at that rate. But what is clear is the UK and the US are falling behind that best practice, which is still Japan. So um, our life experience trends have started to um, not be as good as elsewhere. And in the US, as you say, sometimes you've actually seen a fall, but if you look at the data, where the fall comes from in the US is really quite focused. There's a famous work by Jason Deaton, and they call it the death of despair. And it's just one particular group in society, uh, the sort of white, non-Hispanic, non-college educated people is the way they classify it, who have seen this tremendous drop in life expectancy because of what they call the deaths of despair from opiates, uh, alcohol uh, and suicide. But for every other group, you're still seeing life expectancy increase. So, you know, inequality is a real challenge. It's a challenge in the UK. And I think what's interesting about that, it just goes again to the heart of this notion that how long we live and how healthy we are is malleable. Yeah. It's not fixed and it's malleable downwards and it's malleable in an up direction as well, which is why this is such an important public health campaign. I mean, if you think about the long history of medicine, we made fantastic progress uh, certainly in high income countries, in reducing infant mortality. And that was a major public health initiative. Then we've made major progress in improving uh, mortality and health in middle age. But of course, now the next challenge is to make sure we can improve health and mortality at the older ages. But it, it's going to take the same sort of concerted effort by a health system, but also our public health systems. So it's not all about hospitals. And in fact, you know, the older we get, the less it is about hospitals. We've got a health system that's based around intervention. But the really important thing about aging is to be healthy 
before you need an intervention. It's about prevention, not intervention. And of course, COVID is a great example of that because we know that the important thing for older people is that they don't get COVID rather than they get admitted to hospital and then we treat them. And that's a great metaphor for what is to come in our health system. It's got to be less of a focus on helping people when they get old. That's of course important, but it's about healthy aging. And of course, what's interesting about healthy aging is if you can age better, then your health improves across a range of different uh, diseases. You know, you're less likely to get dementia, less likely to get cancer, less likely to get cardiac problems. And so the interaction effect, which is incredibly valuable, and this has to be the most, I think for me, the most important uh, frontier for the health system in the years ahead, but also for us as individuals, because a child born today has a high chance of living to 80 or 90, it's really important that you can be as healthy as you can when you get to 80 or 90. And that is about what you do at 70, but it's also about what you do at 60. It's about what you do at 50 and probably right the way back to you know what your mother does when uh, they're pregnant. Oh yeah, that, that, that made it a bit late for me. <laughs> but that, that, that's very interesting. I, I, I noticed that you recently published a report with David Sinclair, who's obviously one of the kind of gurus of account aging, a, a big advocate of treating aging as a disease. And, and Martin Ellison, um, essentially about the financial benefits for you yeah. can play if, you, if you have one year or, or 10 years. So if I, I'll just read it out. Um, so I, I presume this is global figures. One, one year of life expectancy is about, worth about 38 trillion and 10 years, um, 367 trillion, which was you know, enormous sums. I mean, is, is that making the argument that we should be looking at sort of looking to target aging specifically rather than just um, targeting every single individual disease yeah. which is impacted by aging, the rather than just going yeah. to cancer and so forth and so forth, you, you, you want to go to the root. Is that is that essentially the point you're making? It is. I mean, and those numbers, by the way, they're about um, how much we value aging better. It's not about the effect on the economy, which I think would be substantial. Obviously, if you can keep people working. So right now, employment starts to fall from about 50 in the UK and the US. Yeah. And that's not people choosing to retire early. So if we can keep people working for longer, that's going to boost the economy. And if they're healthy and active, that's great. But that was very much about just us as individuals. How much do we value aging? And of course, as more and more of us face the prospect of living into our 70s, 80s and 90s, the most important health thing is to age well. And those numbers are taken from what it's worth to the US, that $37 trillion for one more year of healthy life expectancy from improving how we age. And you're absolutely right. It is about focusing not on cancer as a single disease, not focusing on cardiovascular problems, but on aging itself, because as more and more of these life expensive gains are now coming in the years of 70s, 80s or 90s, they're happening in years where there are a lot of what's called age related diseases. And you know, what's striking is the, the highest risk factor for getting cancer, for getting cardiovascular disease is age. Yeah. So if we can improve how we age, then we're going to hopefully reduce the incidence of cancer, dementia, all of those diseases, which means that, of course, improving how we age is going to lead to enormous medical um, value to us. But the other thing that's interesting is, of course, you know, be wonderful. And we've made great progress in reducing the incidence of cancer and the survival rates from cancer. But even if we could somehow get rid of cancer, there would still be the risk of other diseases that come in your 70s and 80s and 90s. So the other great feature is if we could improve how we age, we don't just reduce the risk of getting cancer, but then also getting dementia. Yeah. Which of course leads to even bigger benefits because there's these spillovers, these synergies from having health on many counts being better for, for longer. So in terms of kind of adjusting our, our public health policy um, to target, uh, we're saying, you know, the, the aging process or to, or, or to make aging better rather than just going for every single individual problem which is associated with aging. And what does that actually mean in practice? Yeah, so I mean, I think it means lots of things. And of course, you know, the work that there is this revolution happening in the biology of aging where they really are beginning to understand some of the genetic pathways. It's still, I would I mean, although in the laboratory you can see people regularly reversing aging in cells, etc., uh, extraordinary things happening with mice, we still don't yet know how much of that's going to flow through into treatments, but some of it clearly will. Yeah. Um, and so that'll be extraordinary, but perhaps no more extraordinary than what happened when we started to get 
children surviving the first five years of life. And we used to take it as normal that 20% of children would die in the first five years of life. You couldn't do anything about it. And we did. And then we started doing similar things with middle age and mortality and the number of people dying from heart attacks. We dramatically reduced. So I think we will see some improvements. It's just that we kind of find it hard to conceptualize, but it is a radical change where we start to think that several diseases may have this common cause, which is aging. So it's moving away from a single disease to something deeper. That then starts to tackle quite fundamental notions about aging and what, and what do we mean by aging. But in terms of the health system, as I say, for me, the biggest challenge I think is twofold. One is we need to shift towards much more around prevention, Whereas we have a hospital system, and it is a hospital, not a health system, based around intervening when you're ill, but we've got to start focusing much more on keeping people active. So that's a lot, not probably so much about pills and treatments, it's about people's diet, the environment and activity. I think you're also going to see a huge growth in a food and drink industry that focuses upon supplements to keep you healthy for longer. So you're going to see the health sector become much more than just pharmaceuticals and hospitals but so much what we do in leisure and the products we buy in the high street when we go shopping in the supermarkets. And then I do think we will start to see more budgets being allocated to the, this research around how do we tackle it, the root causes of aging? Because as we say in the paper, the, the gains are huge. There's multi-trillion gains if we can age better. And you know, there's a, this often slips into a big debate about will we live forever? Um, yeah. I don't think that's what we're talking about here at the moment. We're really talking about actually, because we've made life longer, how do we make it healthy for as long as we're actually living? How do we get health span to be as long as lifespan? I do think then there will naturally come pressure. That if we're living healthy into our 90s, then we're going to want to reach to our hundreds. But that's not what I think we're looking at at the moment. We're just saying, how do I keep healthy in my 80s and 90s? And that is the paramount health priority that we face. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely want to get into some more radical stuff later, but um, just, just for the kind of sake of simplicity, I'll, I'll stick with the, um, you know, living up to the century stuff for now. Um, so, do you discuss this sort of stuff with politicians, policymakers? I mean, and if, if so, do they buy the arguments? I, I, I know there's an APP geo longevity, which was yeah. quite recently, which is you know, a very interesting development. Um, although I'm not totally sure exactly whether that focus is more on um, in, in, in some way trying to counter aging or, or whether it focuses on um, making the current process more comfortable. I'm not quite sure exactly what its, what it's role yeah, is. It does everything, I think. I mean, you know, the, the thing about longevity is you've got to cater for everything and you've got to cater for uh, people who are old and you know need support right now. But for me, you've also got to focus on the future role of the current young and middle age and make sure they're as healthy as possible. And that's not all about revolutionary science. That's about some pretty simple things. Like we've seen the recent debate about obesity taxes and sugar taxes that the UK might introduce. We saw you know, tobacco Philip Morris yesterday saying we're not going to be selling cigarettes in 10 years time. So there's a, there's a, there's a massive uh, agenda here. I think it's interesting. When I wrote The Hundred Year Life, um, I was trying to get, so my background as an economist is talking about interest rates and taxes, and it's pretty easy to get people to listen about those topics in government. Uh, and then when I switched to longevity, it's been, it was hard to get people to say, you know, you, you got this wrong. The really big thing is, is that you, at whatever your age, has got more time ahead of you and you need to make the most of that. And if you can, it's great. It's great for you because you'll be living longer and you'll be healthier and you have the finances to support yourself. Uh, and you'll, you know, you'll have a better life. But also it's great for the economy because you can then tap into that longevity dividend. I'm finding politicians beginning and you know, policymakers in general to be a little bit more receptive to it because it's a good news story. You know, for one of the biggest bad news stories is the problems with social care, for instance, we've been seeing a, a health system that's gonna be overburdened. And there's something about the phrase aging particularly I think in UK and US and Europe, that frightens people. Aging is just seen as a negative thing. I mean, it is quite extraordinary, even if we are living longer and it comes with illness, it's still a tremendous achievement that we've got so many people living longer. You know, it's fewer children to mourn, fewer parents lost in middle age, more grandparents meeting their grandchildren. This is a fantastic thing, but we, we fear aging. It's a very negative word. So I think we tend to go down this route of, oh, that's a problem. Um, so, of course, this longevity story is a little bit saying, well, 
actually there's a positive to it as well. You can influence how you age. There are things we can do to make you age better. And we've got to do it because now most people are living into their 80s and 90s. So there's beginnings of a shift, I think. Um, it's hard because, of course, you know, governments are very focused on the short term and they have the demands on their, their budgets. And to come along and say, hey, you've got to put money aside now to help people in 34 years' time is a tough call. But actually, governments aren't totally deaf to that. So I, I would say there's the beginning of a shift. And I think, you know, for me, what I'm about is trying to get individuals to be aware, hey, you are going to live longer than your parents, yep. and longer than your grandparents. You've got to do things differently. And then it's, well, how can we do it? What's available to make the most of this? And I think that message is beginning to spread out more and more. Um, so I'm hoping uh, that we'll see firms pick up on it more and governments pick up on it more. I think there are some signs that it's, it's occurring. Do you think there's a bit of a psychological problem um, in that obviously, you know, from, from the, the moment our species became conscious, we've been aware that we're going to die. Um, and I think it, it, it scares most of us and we come up with very elaborate stories about combating it. I mean, most of world religions are to some extent an answer to the fear of death. I mean, it, and, and that's been the case for so, so long. So we're so used to having, you know, you, you know this very standard, I mean, obviously, as you say, we've made tremendous progress, but we're so used to being sort of 70s, 80s, that's when you die, basically. Mm. Um, do you think, and also after one or two decades of thought that you're going to be pretty frail and unwell, do you think we've become so used to that as a species that we're almost, um, we almost struggle with the idea that this, anything can be done about this. We always see this kind of natural and inevitable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and um, there's a big fight going about whether one should see ageing as a disease. And I, I don't particularly get bogged into that semantic, but it's a, it's a really interesting, you know, fact that it is so controversial because if ageing is natural, then it's not a, a disease. But there's plenty of diseases that we have conquered. And then if you think about ageing as health, which is what I tend to think of it as, it's about keeping people healthy while they're alive. And... To me, that just seems uncontroversial. We want to keep people healthy. But I think you're right. It is a very, very radical change. Because as I was saying earlier, when you get reduced infant mortality and you get um, people surviving for longer, you know, when 20% of kids used to die in the first you know, year or two of life, reducing that to nearly zero is brilliant. But you know what happens when people go from infant to adult years. Now, as we get people going beyond 70 and very large numbers, that is a radical change. So I kind of sympathize with why we're hardwired to think just don't touch that. But it is this notion, that, as I say, that age to some degree is malleable. And the inequality you talked about shows that the diversity with which people age reveals it. So if we accept that diversity, surely we can also accept that we might be able to do something about it because not everyone ages the same way. So why would we then just accept that this person aging this way and that person aging that way is natural and we can't do anything about it? We haven't taken that for previous diseases and health problems. Why should we do it for this? What sort of behavioural changes would you expect if um, the public comes to accept that they're going to have an expanded lifespan? Um, so I, I, I was thinking specifically, I mean, perhaps on the, on the negative side, I mean, would people become more risk averse, do you think? Um, would, would people become more scared of, of accidents or, or, or would people carry on much as they are? I know this is very high. So this is, I'm just interested. No, but this is what's fascinating. And of course, it, it's not totally hypothetical because we have already had this big increase in life expectancy. So um, you have to become more forward looking. I think you have to become more patient. You have to invest more in the future. And you sort of see that happening, I think, in you know, the history of the last 100 and 200 years where we've got more education because we're living longer. We save more because we're living longer. So there is something about that foresight. But I think the key thing for living longer is, yes, you've got to think more of your future self. And for most of us, I think that's rather hard to do. Um, but as life becomes longer and longer, that's going to be the key. So I think developing far-sightedness, making a friend of your future self, developing a sense of patience, all of which historically and evolutionary have not been great advantages of humans, they become really important. Um, but the behavioural changes are immense because as I mentioned earlier, if you are, if you've got more years to go than you have before, 
then you know you just you're going to behave differently I, I think for instance this is one of the reasons and there are many um why people are getting married later uh, they've got more time uh in the 20th century we invented teenagers and we invented pensioners and you know teenagers did not exist before the 20th century it's extraordinary we just went from being a child to being an adult and now you can see sort of that child or adult development is being extended now to perhaps late 20s where people are now marrying buying houses getting a job later some of that is forced upon them by the economy but some of it is i'm just going to take more time developing myself and finding out who i am i'm seeing huge changes of people in their 50s saying wow look at this pension i'm probably going to have to work for another 20 years i am bored stiff doing what i want to do or i i don't know if i can carry on doing what i'm going to do I need to reinvent myself and, and, and do something else. So you're seeing a lot of changes already happening, which then conflicts with the notion, of course, of, you know, where you're 70, you should be doing this. I mean, I think that's the other interesting issue. I think, you know, the average age of the Rolling Stones is like 20 years more than the US Supreme Court. So we, we sort of, you know, how we adjust to these changes is pretty profound because we've never had to do this before in human history. Um, but no, I, th I think we might become more risk averse, or perhaps people become, um, you know, more uh, exploratory. So, you know, in your 50s and 60s, you may say, well, actually, I haven't got 10 years left. I've got 30, 40 years left. I'm going to do something different. We do know, for instance, that divorce rates are falling for those people under 50, but rising for those who are over 50. And okay. it's rising for people in their 80s. And I think, you know, that's that's not a risk averse thing to get divorced in your 80s. So it, who knows which way it goes? It can go in all sorts of different ways. I think the, the other change that is occurring as, as we live for longer, we're also seeing people have fewer children. And I think that leads to some pretty profound changes in society. So, you know, when I was young, I, I, could, I mean, just to give you an idea of how things have changed in the UK, I'm 56. And uh, when I was born, the most common age of death in the UK was zero. It was newborn babies. Uh, and in fact, I was a twin and my baby died at birth. So, you know, that's 56 years ago. Just before COVID, we still don't know the latest numbers. The most common age of death in the UK was 87. So that's an extraordinary sort of swing of them from the most common age of death being zero to 87. And even if you look at the second most common age of death, it was 78 when I was born and it was 88 just before COVID. So there's this really big shift occurring. And, you know, when I was growing up, I went to a family party, you know, family London party. There were loads of cousins, loads of them, quite a lot of aunts and uncles and not many old people. But now if you look at the birth rate, there's just really not many children. And there's loads of old people. If you go to China with this one child policy, you've probably got four grandparents and one grandchild. So I think, you know, that's a, a really fundamental way. How do we get this intergenerational linkages going? because they're going to become much more important. And I think that's hard because the other challenge we've got is that, you know, I keep reading in the press about this generational fight between baby boomers and Gen Z or you know, whatever labels you want to put on people. But that seems to me to miss the most fundamental point, which is the young have never had a better chance of being old. Now, Gen Z will never become a baby boomer. So there's a zero sum game between them. But of course, some news, you know, 10 will become 80 according to the, the stats and so we've got to work much better on stopping this sense that there's young and there's old and somehow getting both intergenerational connection and a recognition that the young are going to be the future old and how do we then get that better understanding going so I think for me that's one of the biggest challenges we face with this longevity. I do want to sound out on some of what, what I call some of the more radical stuff um, so obviously there's a very conscious movement of people of whom um, you work very close with David Sinclair, who's you know, one of the leaders in this field, who are interested not merely in um, having kind of healthy lives into your 80s, 90s. They're interested, I mean, I, I, I'm not kind of interested in the immortality stuff, but mm -hmm. it's the you know, living hundreds of years, essentially. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Aubrey de Grey, who I, I interviewed before, um, uh, has a, a concept called, I think it's um, longevity escape velocity, which essentially yeah. the, you, you, all you need to do is add enough years um, but, but you keep track with the aging yeah. process. You, you don't actually need to conquer aging in one go. What, 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 what do you think about this kind of movement? Do you think, do you think this is a serious thing that we should be, be thinking seriously about? Well, I, I can just play the get out of jail card because I'm not a scientist. And I, can't, <laughs> I mean, mathematically, I can see that it's the logical endpoint of what we're talking about. Because, yeah. you know, 
what we're talking about here is reducing the mortality rate uh, with age. And if you can sort of make the mortality rate the same at all ages, then you haven't got immortality, but you've got very long lives. Um, I, I don't know if that's possible. I mean, it, what is interesting is there's slowing down aging and then there's reversing aging. And if you could reverse aging, that then raises these possibilities. Um, I, I look at it a slightly different way, which is that, you know, what I think is really interesting, I think we are on the beginnings of something very different for humanity. But the first is, uh, as I mentioned, the first time ever a child today has to plan their life for when they get to 80, 90, or even 100. Yeah. So they're going to have to live very differently. But what, what to me was really interesting in the work that I did with Martin Ellison and David Sinclair was you get this virtuous circle in interest in aging. So the older you are, the more interested you are in aging better. The more old people there are, the more a country's interested in aging better. And then as you sort of start to live into your 90s, which is what's happening now, you of course really want to be healthy in your 80s. But once you get healthy into your 80s and 90s, you then are interested in living into 100. And then once you live to 100, you're really interested in living healthy to 100. And once you do that, you're interested in living to 110. So there's a virtuous circle at work here that says, actually, if we can live healthy into our 80s and 90s, we won't stop there. We'll just put more and more money in. And then the limit will be how far out can we go? Uh, and that's where we just don't know. We know that it's possible for humans to live to 120. Um, and if you can logically crack aging, then it's possible they can live even longer than that. Uh, I, what's impossible for me to know is how quickly that will occur. You talk to Aubrey and David, they think it's gonna happen certainly within their lifetime and perhaps even sooner. Um, I always feel that things happen more slowly than those at the cold face think it will. Um, and I think there's a lot of steps to be done before that happens. Um, and in some ways I hope that's true because I think for society and the economy to just suddenly live into 500 would just be a, a, a real, it would be very difficult. So, uh, you know, I, I, I used to sort of, when I first came into this, think that the scientists, there was a lot of science fiction there. Um, I do increasingly feel that we will probably make medical breakthroughs that improve how we age sooner than society will adapt to thinking about age mm -hmm. and longer lives. We have centuries if not millennia of prejudice and fixed beliefs about aging which are often are myths I and mean, one of the challenges because many people haven't lived to their 80s 90s and 100 we don't know much about that age it's really right. not been much of a center focus of attention or study so there's lots of misunderstandings i think as well about that age. and one very interesting thing you mentioned earlier was, was the impact of covid um, so, I mean, you know, one thing we've learned over the past year and a half is that the public will accept huge state intervention in their lives in order to safeguard, safeguard public health, which suggests that there perhaps is room for radical projects, but the, the public would be on board if, if, if they can be proven to work. What, what, what do you think will be the big impact of COVID on this debate? Yeah, I mean, extra, I mean, as economists working on longevity, when COVID first hit, you know, there's the personal fear and sadness of a global pandemic which is still there but you also think wow no one's going to be interested in longevity now yeah. what is extraordinary is actually how more and more people are interested in this and i think that's because you know covid's done you know it's this huge multi-dimensional shock on so many different levels but it's accelerated lots of trends that were already happening you know working from home for instance and using technology but also it's revealed just how many older people there are yeah and therefore, it's revealed just how important is they're healthy, because we've seen with COVID, there isn't a trade off between health and the economy. If you haven't got a healthy population, you haven't got a healthy economy. So I, I think that's been a really big insight. And then, of course, it's emphasised the importance of preventative health rather than intervention, the limits to intervention. Um, and I think that's going to have a huge impact on many individuals as well. I've just noticed more people saying, what can I do to, to make me sure that I'm healthy? Because yeah. although you are more likely to get bad outcomes with COVID if you're old, there's still a lot of variation depending upon your underlying health conditions. How do I keep myself uh, healthy? Um, and so I, I think preventative health, um, uh, both public level and the individual level will be a, a, a big uh, thing from it. Um, I think the other thing that's been really revealing to me as an economist, economists are always interested in what we call revealed preference. So 
you know, people talk about what they value, but you should actually look at their actions because that shows what they really value. And I think it's why it's a dismal science in many ways. But um, you know, what we've seen is governments have been prepared to accept huge falls in GDP in order to save lives. Yeah. And that just reveals how important health is, which goes back to everything I've said before, which is that the really big part of the economy going forward is what I'll call the evergreen economy, not the silver economy. It's not looking after the needs of older people. It's making sure we age well, because that is what we would spend a fortune on. So I think all these things are beginning to emerge. The other thing I think will happen from it is it's quite remarkable how fast uh, the new vaccines are rolled out. And I think making sure that we can get new treatments rolled out cheaply and quickly will be a really important part uh, of the legacy of COVID because right now it is very expensive to develop new drugs and that then makes the drugs very expensive and it'd be wonderful to come up with treatments to slow down aging but they're likely to be expensive so how do we make sure we have these drugs but we can reduce the expense to make sure that they're widely available and we can all benefit from them. I mean, just one final question. I mean, it, it's, it seems there's going to be a big debate on social care. I mean, it, it, it's been seeming that for that past decade, but um, the, the indications are now that the government is serious and they actually want to do something about it. Do you think this would be a good opportunity to get your kind of arguments across? Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the challenge with, I mean, social care is a, a, a real problem. I mean, you do have to spend a lot of money on it. Uh, and as a macroeconomist, I think we just have to and yeah. it is a lot but governments are used to very large sums of money um and you know it's important to do that the whole social care agenda though is very interesting because as i mentioned earlier we've got this this issue which is we're living longer lives and most of the gains of longer life are healthy but the window at the end has got larger but we're always drawn to that negative window and social care is a, a great example of it so We've absolutely got to make sure we look after people in that window at the end, and that's expensive. Um, we've got to recognise that not everyone ends up there. There's a great deal of diversity. And then we've got to say, okay, as well as supporting people there, how do we make as many people as possible healthy for as long as possible, but also get the economic benefits? Because we talk about raising taxes to pay for social care, but we will have to work for longer if we're living for longer. And actually that's not a bad thing if the jobs are good and you're in good health. And that's the best way of paying for the extra social care that comes from longer lives. You know, I, I think there is what I call a three dimensional longevity vision to be achieved. The first is we're living longer lives, great. Secondly, we need health span to catch up with lifespan. So we need to compress morbidity, get as few people as possible who have to have uh, care. And then the third thing is to get the economic benefits of longer, healthier lives which means supporting people in working for longer. And some of that comes after the age of 65, 66, whatever the state pension age is, but really focusing on 50 plus where lots of people start to leave the labor market, either because they're in bad health, either because they've got to look after someone who's in bad health, or they lose their job and find it very hard to get another one because they haven't got the skills or there's lots of ageism. So for me, the really best way of getting that longevity dividend is through the economy rather than just adding more taxes. We've got to adjust to longer lives. So we get this three-dimensional longevity and a longer life, a longer, healthier life, and a longer, more productive life. I know I said last question, but I'll be kicking myself when I ask this now. Um, obviously, at the moment, we're, we're seeing tremendous improvements in how AI and automation can actually lead into a debate about, you know, will in a few decades time we see mass job losses um, and you know the whole UBI movement is essentially founded on that that principle. I mean, how does that how does that play into the play? I mean, I mean, could you know could we end up in a situation if if you have significant advances in AI and automation where people have significantly longer lives but also highest ways spend a much shorter proportion of working, for example, or or, or is this all part of other things? No, I mean that there's I mean. You know, the interaction between longevity, AI, and sustainability is huge. Um, but on the AI, um, yeah, so there's normally a couple of takes on this one. The first is AI is going to take away all our jobs. Uh, and if people are work for longer, where the job's going to come from? I actually think AI might be quite good for older workers. Um, what you're going to tend to find is that um, the jobs that AI will take away will be those which older people tend not to do. So older people tend to do jobs that are more around human interaction, yeah. understanding people, teams, and, and AI, it, it, that's never gonna be the, the, its best part of AI. 
So I think a lot of the new jobs may actually quite support older workers. And you're seeing already older workers being very engaged in self-employment, contractual work, gig economy, because it offers a sort of flexibility. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's interesting. So I think it could support older workers. But I think the really big shift, if you look at the 20th century, we saw uh, retirement created, you know, the creation of retirement was a tremendous invention. People used to work until they died. And we created retirement, which is a great thing. But as life expectancy increased, we didn't see an increase in retirement. So people got more and more leisure at retirement. And I think what we're seeing now is people are recognizing they're going to have to work for longer, which then I think means you're going to see more leisure taken before retirement. And that may be a four day working week, which sounds nice, or it may be sometimes I'm working six days a week, but other times I'm going to have a part time job doing two or three days working remotely from home, uh, perhaps doing something in the gig economy, doing something entrepreneurial. So I think the shift will be to having more leisure now, this side of retirement, but having a longer working career. And I think that the trick with technology is to make sure it enables us to do that. I mean, I personally am I'm not a great fan of UBI because I think if we can have good jobs that give people a sense of purpose and a standard of living, that's the best outcome. Um, and we need to make sure that we think about how to use AI to create those good jobs that creates an inclusive sense of purpose and a shared standard of living. So I think that would be for me what we should try and do. Um, and, but I think you know it is clearly going to change the career path because if you're working for a lot longer you're going to move away from a three-stage life of education work and retirement to what we call in a hundred year life a multi-stage life where you're going to go through several different careers and career shifts sometimes just gunning for the money other times uh, better work-life balance um but i think ai will help on that was it andrew it's been an absolute pleasure um thank you so much for your time